boxing news. Ow! Okay, we'll start with this. Unbeaten up and comer from Poland, Lara Grzeb posted this image to her Instagram account from the World Boxing Council's convention, which is already underway and she is in attendance for. She posted this image with a caption that reads, the world needs this fight, referencing a potential fight with reigning WBC Super Bantamweight champion, Yemi Mercado of Mexico. Yemi is one of four champions in the Super Bantamweight division. Super Bantamweight, that's where Ellie Scottney's got the IBF, Yemi's got the WBC, Sigaline Lafarve of France, she's got the WBO, and Mayerlene Rivas, who's going to be in action this weekend, she's got the WBA. I think at least one problem that Lara is facing in cornering a fight with Yemi Mercado is that she doesn't appear anywhere in the World Boxing Council's rank standings at 122. And I can only deduce that she aspires to change that, which is why she's in attendance for the World Boxing Council's annual convention. Perhaps in their next set of updated rank standings, we will see the name of Lara Grzeb, who sports a professional record of 10 wins with no losses, no draws, and three knockouts. She's not a knockout merchant. She's a finesse fighter. Fast on her feet, fast hands, moving and punching and pecking away at her opponents, pot shotting from the outside. That is her methodology. Some years older than the reigning champion and having the amateur background that the reigning champion doesn't have, she is still a lot less experienced as a professional than Yamilet Mercado. Sports a professional record of 22 wins with three losses, no draws, five knockouts, having never been knocked out in 25 professional bouts. As stated, even though Yami is three years younger than Laura Grzeb, Yami's 25, whereas Laura is 28. Yami is noticeably more experienced as a professional, having shared the ring with distinguished professionals and capable fighters like Amanda Serrano, Alejandra Guzman, the same Alejandra Guzman that knocked out Ramla Ali. Yami's been there and done that. He beat her on points in what was a great fight, having shared the ring with legends like Amanda Serrano, Mariana Juarez, capable fighters like Kudukwashe, Chiwandire. It's safe to say that Yemi Mercado's quality of competition is head and shoulders above anything Laura Grizeb has seen so far. So even though Laura is a bit older and she does have a decent amateur background, Yemi is much, much further along in her career than Laura is. Currently, Laura is EBU champion at Super Bantamweight. The EBU title, what is in many ways a stepping stone for any European-based fighter looking to climb up the pro ranks. And she is good. She has fought some good fighters, just not as many as Yemi Mercado. But, you know, she did give Martine Besson her first professional loss. Spain's own Marion Herrera, she gave her her first professional loss. She's coming off a dominant points win over the UK's Stevie Levy. What would happen if you put Laura in the ring with Yemi Mercado? This is the first time, I think the first time, I've ever seen Laura express an interest in facing one of the champions anywhere in between 122 and 126, where she's campaigned. When she started out, she started out up there at featherweight and eventually made her way down to super bantamweight. At featherweight, Amanda Serrano currently reigns as undisputed champion, and she is not ready for Amanda. By any stretch, winning an alphabet title seems a more feasible proposition for Lara at 122 than 126, though that's not saying it's going to be easy. Those four champions at 122, they're formidable fighters, every single one of them, and there are that many more formidable up-and-comers and contenders. 122 really is a deep division. This is the first time, the very first time, I've seen Lara court the idea of challenging for a world title. She wants Yami. Is she gonna get her? Yami is a Zenfer Promotions fighter. Zenfer Promotions based out of Mexico, south of the border. And Laura is with Knockout Boxing Promotions based out of Poland. Those are two regional promotional outfits, albeit well-to-do outfits that do a decent job of keeping their fighters busy and active. And somebody's gonna have to travel. It's either Yami's gonna have to go to Poland or Laura is gonna have to go to Mexico. Laura isn't her mandatory challenger and her name does not appear anywhere in the World Box 
Boxing Council's ranked standings at 122. So they're going to have to do something about that because at this time, she has no claim to challenge Yami for the WBC title. And while that could change, until it does, this conversation is in the air. I would like to see them fight. But in order for Laura to get in position to do so, she has to challenge someone in the WBC's ranked standings because she's not there. Her name doesn't appear anywhere at 122. We'll see if that changes in the coming weeks and months. In the Mayweather gym, it's like, the truth is there's a lot of like cap going on. Like fighters who who really not that good, but then they got Kamel. Kamel putting a little spotlight on their gym. so. They trying to bandwagon off of his uh, his his spotlight at the end of the day, but really, truthfully, he's the only good fighter that I've seen in that gym as of uh, when I went in there. I feel so inclined to agree. The Mayweather Gym and Mayweather Promotions as a whole, it's not like they just came out yesterday. They've been around for years now, and the Mayweather Gym is responsible for Roly Romero. I mean, get a look at that guy. That's the gym that gave us that train wreck. So when Shaklor Stevenson one of the best fighters in the sport today. A two-division champion going on three if he takes care of business this Thursday. When he says that most of those fighters really aren't very good and that the only halfway decent fighter there is Kermel Moten, I do feel so inclined to agree. Just because it's the quote-unquote Mayweather gym and Floyd Mayweather slaps his name on something doesn't make it good by default. It don't. He's not the one fighting the fights for them. If you know enough about it to disagree, if you know something that Shakur Stevenson doesn't, then you tell it. How many world-class guys are boxing out of the Mayweather gym today? The only halfway decent boxer that the Mayweather gym has produced doesn't even box out of the Mayweather gym, and that's Gervonta Davis, a guy who's known, who's somewhat popular, but refuses to fight his contemporaries, like Shakur Stevenson, like Devin Haney, like Teofimo Lopez and Vasil Lomachenko before them. That's the only halfway decent fighter they've produced. You will notice that many of the good American amateur standouts, when leaving the amateurs and going into the pros, they don't go to Floyd Mayweather. They don't go to the PBC. You may ask why. And the deal structure is a big part of it. Some months ago, unbeaten up-and-comer Floyd Schofield and his father detailed why it was they decided to not sign to the PBC, to not sign to Al Heyman, and in so many words, it was the contract. He's 360 contracts dick and a booty contracts. The amateurs, the really good ones coming out of the amateurs, they have good representation. And they're not going to let those amateurs walk into some dick in the booty kind of deal. Usually, they end up going to top rank and some others end up going to match room. So when the good amateurs are signing to anyone other than the PBC or TMT, what you're left with is a lot of B, C, and D level fighters. The ones you'll find at the Mayweather Gym. Like Roly. Roly Romero. That's what he is, a D-level fighter. Thus, when Shakur S. Stevenson says what he says about the Mayweather gym and who's fighting out of that gym, I do feel so inclined to agree. Just because it's Floyd's name outside the building, just because it's Floyd's gym, doesn't mean he's mass-producing Mayweathers that are fighting out of that gym. He so clearly isn't. And as far as that Kermel kid, we'll see how far he goes. Just because Floyd's promoting him or just because Floyd says he's good doesn't mean I'm going to agree with him. We're not here to assume that he's good based on what Floyd says. We're here to see him prove it. And until he does, those eggs need more bacon. I don't care what Floyd said, since when did I start swearing by things that Floyd says? I agree with Shakur. It's not all killers and gorillas and world champions fighting out of the Mayweather gym. It's just a bunch of leftovers. I ain't gonna lie, you love Devin, man. Right? <laughs> <laughs> You've been asking me about Devin since <laughs> yesterday. Let's, let's focus on Edwin. Hey, we're gonna have an Edwin question off the line. Nah, I'll answer all the questions. I don't give a fuck. Chakra, what you what saying say? was Cambosis, Frank, and now Edwin all said that you should have took it for the opportunity. What's your response? What what the fuck do I care what Edwin say? Edwin is Edwin. Who the fuck is Edwin? Edwin, this is first big fight. Edwin got to prove himself on Thursday, so um, I don't. I hear you, but I know you love Devin so much, and just like a lot of these other media people, y'all got favorites. I'm starting to understand why Tank treat y'all the way he treat y'all. He ignore incognito to y'all, cause y'all is y'all y'all trifling. Like y'all come in this motherfucker. And, Pick favorites and, and put y'all own narratives out there and spread lies and um, I just think that shit wrong. Boxing media is the fakest motherfuckers 
in the world. Um, with all due respect to y'all, but y'all fake as shit. Shakur Stevenson has had quite enough of the boxing media for what he describes as being trifling behavior. That the boxing media that are intended to just report the stories, report the stories as they are, that's not what they do. They tend to play favorites. They tend to take sides. A content creator like Ellie Sackback almost immediately comes to mind because he doesn't hide his fandom of Gervonta Davis or Errol Spence Jr. That when he likes a fighter, he really likes a fighter. He's not the only one though. Though still one of the more glaring examples of what it is Shakur S. Stevenson is describing that this subject, you know, Devin Haney, Shakur Stevenson, what happened? Why didn't they fight? That this has been a subject as long as it has been. And Devin has done as many podcasts as he has without being asked the hard questions, the real ones. When you say you were about to pay Shakur Stevenson three times the amount of money he makes per fight, where was that money coming from? Because you yourself don't have a broadcast partner. You may have DHP promotions, Devin Haney promotions, but there's no network money backing it. The money wasn't coming from Bob because according to Bob, there was no substance to Devin's offer. So that's a question that needs to be asked that hasn't been asked by the boxing media. That would go a long way in telling us who, who's telling the truth and who isn't, as well as Devin's contention that Shakur's the one that walked away. If Shakur is the one that walked away, then why does he still have a title shot? And why is your title now vacant? I haven't seen a single member of the boxing media bring this question up to Devin Haney. So I've, I've got some idea of what it is Shakur Stevenson is talking about. These guys do like to play favorites and they play favorites to the point to where they're not even doing their job because it's their job to retrieve this information. In essence, that's the job. Shakur Stevenson, like his mentor, Terrence Crawford. No, he's not big on media. He's not big on the boxing media. And I see why. When the people at the PBC were freezing him out for the last five years, egging Errol Spence Jr. on, celebrating whatever he did. They actually celebrated him winning a points decision over a fat Mikey Garcia who had never done anything in the welterweight division instead of putting pressure on him, putting him in the hot seat to fight Terrence Crawford sooner rather than later. Instead, all they did was sing his praises and plaudits. I don't think the pundits did their job in that situation either. I don't think they put enough pressure on Errol Spence Jr. They have their favorites. Thus, I see why Terrence Crawford, like Shakur Stevenson, he's not a fan of the media. He's not a fan of the boxing media at large, a member of them. Marcos Villegas, who I think is pretty neutral. He doesn't play sides like some others. He said, UK fighters promote the media that do interviews with them, share their interviews and social content. Fighters in the United States trash the shit out of the media. No support. I can't say that Marcos Villegas is guilty of taking sides. I don't think Michelle Joy Phelps is either or Radio Raheem. But then again, these aren't the kinds of interviewers and content creators that volunteer their two cents. They don't often do that, but some others do. And it's those other individuals that Shakur Stevenson is more or less talking about. To Marcos Villegas' point, it does seem like the UK fighters have a better rapport with the content creators and the interviewers than US fighters have with the content creators and the interviewers. But you will also notice that in the United States' boxing scene, there's a lot more narratives. There are clicks, and it is more tribal. That's not saying that across the pond, it's all sunshine and rainbows and everybody's getting along, but it is more cordial than what you see here in the United States. It's a mixture of unruly fighters who sometimes still think they have to play the tough guy, still have to be the bad boy. Some members of the media that like to take sides play sides based on who gives them access. Because that's a part of it too. The rapport that is built between the interviewer and the fighter. There are all kinds of content creators in the boxing cosmos. Now some, some rely primarily on interviews and access to fighters and their teams to create content. Other content creators rely on analysis, looking at fights or situations. They're not necessarily relying on access to fighters in order to create content other content creators, they focus more on compiling highlights and footage 
of actual fights, creating highlight reels with the footage or narrating stories parallel to the footage. There are all types of content creators in the boxing cosmos, but the ones that rely on access to fighters and doing interviews, they're the ones caught in the crossfire of Shakur Stevenson's heated outbursts. Some are more guilty than others. The dichotomy has changed in the way that the sport of boxing is covered, where before, major periodicals and major networks would have their reporters go out there and report on the stories. Now, no. you got more freelancers, what are content creators, essentially, and they rely on the relationships, access to the fighters, in order to create that content. Retrieve it. Part of being able to retrieve that content on a consistent basis does sometimes involve buttering a boxer's bread. Not everyone, but some content creators. And they do this long enough that they're almost unofficial members of a boxer's street team, running interference for them and propping up narratives. And, and that is more or less what Shakur Stevenson is referring to. It's because now, the line that would distinguish boxing media from boxing fans is a lot blurrier than it used to be. In many instances, the boxing media are boxing fans behaving like boxing fans instead of journalists because many of them, they're not journalists. They're just fans with cameras. And journalistic integrity, in a very general sense, not being everything that it used to be, well, that's what creates these situations when you're relying on clicks more than accuracy and accurate information the system has changed where before there was an emphasis on accuracy these days it's an emphasis on speed and just getting the story out there whether it's true or not and some are more guilty of this than some others though some are being caught in the crossfire. What it all boils down to is an occupational hazard in today's boxing landscape. Do you know that's a big part of the reason I don't like doing interviews and I don't rely on access to fighters in order to deliver content? I'm gonna be completely honest about what I think given a situation and somebody might not like that and I might not like that somebody. Though them not liking that or them not liking me or me not liking them has fuck all to do with whether or not the information is good, whether or not the information is accurate. And the opinions balanced, you can't please everybody in a nutshell.